internship at the University of California in San Diego, uh, did pediatric residency. Uh, and I was chief resident there for a year. Uh, had a big residency program, um, fun place. And then I did a fellowship in infectious disease. And uh, I did the, the original research on ribavirin and on Zovirax. Um, because I was an infectious disease fellow and we were doing viral research. So, and then I was an infection control officer at a hospital. I was in pediatric practice and I was running an intensive care and neonatal unit <clears throat> at the same time. And I got, I liked acute care and I got interested in emergency medicine. I switched careers and did emergency medicine uh, from 1990 to 2002. Um, so, I'm, I'm, you know, I, I had an experience with medicine which was very positive and good outcomes, but most of it was, was involving either children or acute care. Uh, in about 1996, uh, my wife decided that she didn't like the way the fillings in her teeth looked. Uh, and she had a couple bouts with uh, Hashimoto's and that she was going to get the mercury in her teeth removed. As you may or may not know, uh, the amalgam the amalgam is a bonding of several metals together. The amalgam in the teeth is about 50% mercury, and the rest of it is a mixture of tin and copper and silver. Uh, it doesn't actually bind with the teeth. It just, the, the, the tooth is hollowed out, and then the filling is pushed in there so that it's wedged, so there's a little bigger surface underneath than there is on top, and it stays in. Uh, the problem with it is, is that mercury has a boiling point of about 120 degrees. So if you have a hot cup of soup or a hot cup of coffee or you chew gum, the mercury in that amalgam comes off. And you can measure that mercury with a mercury vapor meter. Now, uh, the mercury levels are astoundingly high and they off-gas off the teeth for the entire life of the filling. They can enter the body, they're swallowed, they can get into the neural tissue and the tonsillar tissue. They can be taken by neuronal uptake up into the brain. They can be swallowed and involved in the intestine. And if you take experimental animals, say sheep, and these experiments have been done and they're published, and you put mercury fillings in them, and you radio label the mercury, and then you wait through month, three months and you put them in front of a nuclear scanner, what you'll find is that their kidneys and their brains and their hearts and their livers are full of mercury from the mercury that was put into their teeth. So it's not safe. It's very political. The American Dental Association receives a kickback on every amalgam filling sold. It's just like the AMA gets a kickback every time a CPT code is, is done. So these organizations have sort of vested interests in keeping the system going. But they're not safe and they're not even very good. Uh, they are durable. So she decides she want to have them taken out. And if you take a high speed drill and drill mercury, you get vaporized mercury. It comes off and it goes into the body. Something very interesting that we did a few years ago is we, we actually had a patient who was a physicist and he had a mercury vapor meter. And it's the meter that the EPA uses if there's a mercury spill. Now you know a dentist is allowed to put mercury in your mouth, but he's not allowed to throw it in the garbage can if he takes it out. Because it's a hazardous waste and it goes in a special container and it has to be handled specifically because it is hazardous. In one microgram amounts, it's toxic to neural tissue. So, um, if somebody drops a thermometer or there is a canister of mercury that spills, it's a hazmat emergency and the hazmat guys will come and they will do the cleanup and they will use a mercury vapor meter to make sure that the concentration of mercury in the air is less than 10 micrograms or 10, pipe, 10 parts per million because that's felt to be a safe level. Uh, if any of you have mercury fillings in your mouth and I put the mercury vapor meter in your mouth, you'll read anywhere from 50 to 600 parts per million of mercury vapor coming off your teeth right now. So your mouth is a hazardous waste dump. So it's crazy, but that's just how it is. So she decided to have the mercury taken out of her teeth. Shortly there late, later, she had a flare-up of her thyroiditis. And she lost, now she's an athlete. She's one of the best triathletes in 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 this certainly this area and um, our hobby is triathlon so I just finished my 40th Ironman last weekend um, and uh, she doesn't do long races she does short ones but she's very good but after this episode she woke up one day and she was unable to lift up her arm 
and she lost her glute on one side. And uh, the consensus was that there was some sort of neuropathy. Was it MS? Was it something else? And I had no idea what was going on. I was doing emergency room shifts. And she's a nurse, and she has a nursing agency. So I went to pick her up one night, and just by accident, there was a, a biological dentist, a natural dentist. Now, the difference between a natural dentist and a regular dentist is the natural dentist understands that what you put in the mouth will affect the body. And that, and that very great care is taken that the materials used are actually compatible with the person. That they're not going to cause some sort of immune reaction or autoimmune reaction, or that the materials themselves won't be toxic and off-gas and actually hurt the person. So I, I, he was coming out to his car, and I was sitting in the car waiting for her. And I said to him, here's the story. She had a mercury out. Now she's got this neuropathy. Uh, what, what, um, what do you think? And he said, I think she probably got a big dose of mercury when he drilled it out, and that probably she was mercury poisoned. And you better go to Seattle, because there's a medical doctor up there who trains doctors in mercury toxicity. This was like 1996. There was no consciousness at all about mercury. You know, now at least tuna is labeled that pregnant women shouldn't eat too much because their babies can get mercury toxic. But then there was really nothing. So I flew up there, did a few courses with him, learned about it, and came back. And then when we did the testing on her, found out that she actually was mercury toxic. And she's completely recovered and she gets, you know, podium places probably three or four times a summer now. Uh, she's completely fine. Uh, the thyroiditis is resolved and the, and, the, uh, and the neuropathy completely resolved within about uh, six to eight months after we started treating her. So this got me very interested in, holy smokes, there is a whole universe of things out there that I have no idea of. You know, I was working for a while in an emergency room in California where we had people doing, uh, they, were, they would fly the planes that would spray, that would drop the pesticide powders on the crops. I was working in the, in the, um, in the lettuce belt and there was an emergency room out there and I was doing shifts out there as, as moonlighting and we would get guys that would come in that were, that were acutely poisoned with uh, organopesticide poisons. And so I had some experience with toxicology but nothing like this. And so uh, I got interested in it and then she was interested in it and we started to go all over the country to find doctors or meetings or things where we could learn about this. And there was an extra little room in the back room of the nursing agency, and we went and got certified in chel what's called chelation therapy, which a chelation is a, is a chemical or a substance which will bind to heavy metal and pull it out of your body. So as you may have known, if you get someone with acute lead poisoning, if you give them, ED, you know, you look in the PDR and you say, well, what should we give them? Well, EDTA is an amino acid that is a chelator. You can give it by IV or oral. It will go around the body, it will bind mercury, arsenic, cadmium, lead, and it will then come out of the urine and rid you of the substance. And that's called a chelator. Chela in Greek means uh, crab or claw, and it's almost like it claws onto the heavy metal and then it pulls it out. So we got certified in chelation. We had a couple of friends who's, who's had uh, cardi their, they, their fathers had had cardiovascular disease at a young age. And, uh, and if you give EDTA chelation, you can pull out these heavy metals, you can reduce the plaque buildup, and you can open up arteries and veins. And uh, in fact, the first patient we had was an insurance executive who came in with an almost gangrenous foot who had been told by the podiatrist that he had a major high-grade obstruction of both of the arteries in his feet and that he should get a, an amputation at his ankle uh, because he was going to lose the toes and he would eventually lose the foot. And the safest thing to do was to cut it, cut it off at the ankle. So he went to get a second opinion and he saw an orthopedist and the orthopedist uh, did an angiogram on him and he found, he said, you know, the arteries, your popliteal arteries are just not very good and you could cut the foot off but probably you ought to go uh, above the knee because pretty soon you're going to lose that and you might as well just have one operation. And which choice would you take? <laughs> he didn't want either one. So he came in and he said, do you think chelation was that would help me? And I said, I have no idea, but we can try it and it won't hurt you. Uh, there, at, 
by that point there have been tens of thousands of treatments, there's no fatalities, it's very safe. So we started doing chelation on him, we tuned up his nutritional program, we found he had some deficiencies, and lo and behold, the blue toes got pink, and the full foot function came back, and he never lost his foot, and he was completely fine. And then we got even more interested, and he said, holy smokes, there is a lot of people out there that are getting medical care, which isn't really the best care for them. Now I think if you get run over by a car, or you're in the middle of an acute MI, or you have an appendix, that there is no better medical care than, than what we have. Because it's, 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 it can really save people's lives. But most of what you're going to be seeing in your practices isn't that. It's people who have chronic situations. They have diabetes, and they have arthritis, and they have coronary artery disease, and they have cancer, and they have COPD, and they have osteoporosis, and, and they are suffering from lifestyle disease. No medicine of which will make any difference on in prolonging their survival or really improving their condition. We know that all the diabetes drugs make people die earlier of cardiovascular disease. You can normalize the hemoglobin A1C and the glucose, it doesn't make any difference. You get progressive disease with these things if you don't treat the underlying cause, which is they're eating way too many carbohydrates. So when you boil this thing down, and so our practice is full of medical failures, so to speak, or people who don't want those interventions because either they've had bad experience or, or they just haven't gotten cured. And so what happens is, is that most of the things that people suffer from, really there's two things wrong. One is they have things in their body that shouldn't be there. Now we live in a very toxic environment. There's about 70,000 known chemicals that we're exposed to virtually all the time. Plastics and petrochemicals and heavy metals and, um, and um, flame retardants and they're, they're, our whole environment is full of them. And we are exposed to these all the time. And they get in our bodies. And some of us have good detoxification systems and we're able to get the things out. And some of us don't and they accumulate. And they're all cellular poisons. You know, if you're eating food that's not organic, that food is full of pesticides. Those pesticides build up in your body. Uh, we know the problems with estrogens in the environment. You know, all the dairy products virtually, if they're not organic, are full of hormones. Because the cows are given hormones so that they grow faster and they produce more milk. And, and there's a lot of estrogen mimickers in, in, you know, heavy metals and pesticides and chemicals act as estrogen mimics in our system. They, tar they, they are able to latch on those estrogen receptors in our cells. And so you're seeing girls at seven years old now who have breasts and they're pubertal. And, you, and I, see, I see a lot of little boys that now have breasts and they're feminized. I saw a, foot, a, a very good football player uh, just yesterday. His mother brought him in. She said he's in the weight room. He's working out all the time. He's got this extra layer of body fat. He's got breasts. What's wrong with him? And we measured his hormone levels, and we found that his estradiol, estriol, and estrone levels were high. They were high for a male. And his testosterone was actually on the lowest side. And he is suffering from environmental estrogen overload. And so people have things in their bodies that shouldn't be there, and it can make them sick. So that's sort of the first half of it. All people with autoimmune disease, cancer, any chronic illness, chronic fatigue disease, Lyme disease, all these chronic sorts of things, when you look at these people for these kinds of things, chemical, environmental toxins, they're all full of them. The other thing on the other side is that people have major uh, deficiencies of nutrients. You know, we've been measuring vitamin D levels since 1997. I see more and more traditional physicians measuring it. But virtually 99% of the people that we measure have vitamin D levels below 30. We know that if your level is between 70 and 90, these are epidemiologic studies and they're pretty good. If your serum 25 hydroxy vitamin D level is between 70 and 90, your incidence of colon cancer, breast cancer, and prostate cancer is reduced by about 46%. One nutrient deficiency, vitamin D affects about 3,000 genes. It affects everything from bone disease, 
some of your hypertensive patients, I've had several hypertensive patients who came in on, on multiple medications with hypertension um, uh, who were vitamin D deficient. And when we gave them vitamin D, their blood pressure normalized. So we look for deficiencies. We do big panels on what are they missing. Okay, selenium, zinc, vitamin D, CoQ10. And we do mineral levels on red blood cells. I'll, get, I'll, I'll tell you about this. So if you measure a serum, magnesium, or potassium, about 1% of the pool of magnesium and potassium in the body is in the serum. 99% is in the cells. The serum level by the, by the brain is kept at normal levels as long as possible. And the way the brain does that is it pulls the nutrients, it pulls the magnesium and potassium out of the cells so that the serum level can look normal, because that's what's monitored. So if a magnesium normal level is between 2 and 4 and someone has a 2.1, most people would look at it and say it's probably okay. But if you measure the red blood cell magnesium as a reflection of tissue levels, so normally when you do a serum magnesium, you draw blood, you spin it, you take the serum, you measure the magnesium. There are labs out there that if you take the blood, spin it down, take the serum off, take the red blood cells, rinse them off, break them, measure the magnesium level, you get a true reflection of what the magnesium status is in the body. And we found that about 80% of people are magnesium deficient and many people are potassium and zinc and selenium deficient. And of course, these are coenzyme factors with hundreds and hundreds of body reactions. And you know, your thyroid's not going to work, and your, and your kidney's not going to work, and your liver detoxification is not going to work, and your energy systems aren't going to work when you have deficiencies of these major minerals. When I was an emergency room doctor at a chest pain center uh, for a long time. And we knew that when someone came in with acute MI, we would give them two grams IV of magnesium right away, and our salvage rate was much better. And a lot of people were magnesium deficient, and they would get arrhythmias. A lot of your chronic atrial fibs and your atrial flutters are actually this combination of they're low in these nutrients because magnesium and potassium are sedative. You know, they're, 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 they, they, they relax cell membranes, and they make them less hyperactive. So when we look at these, this combination of what is happening with toxicity and what is happening with uh, deficiency, and you can, you can then get a really good analysis on the patient. And then if you can get them on a lifestyle where they're actually eating food that's going to be nutritious for them and not toxic for them, most of the people who have chronic illness will get better. And they'll feel it within one to three months. It's not a long-term thing. And when they come in, we usually boost them up with things like uh, vitamin and mineral IVs. Because you know if you're magnesium deficient and you take oral magnesium, you may not absorb it. That the absorption of magnesium is dependent on magnesium. So we give them a couple of grams of magnesium in a cocktail with vitamin C and some calcium and some B vitamins. It's called a Myers cocktail. There was a doctor in Baltimore named Dr. Myers, and he figured out this combination. He started giving it to his patients, and his patients liked it. And they would come in, you're feeling a little tired, you're feeling like you're going to come down with something. You get a Myers cocktail, boosts you up. So most of our new patients, we'll give them a couple of these a week, uh, along with glutathione. Glutathione is the, is the major intracellular antioxidant. And many people are depleted because they're being inundated with free radicals and they don't have enough antioxidants to keep them even. And so glutathione can be given intravenously. It's helpful. And then there's a little brochure there on ozone. Ozone is the most miracle natural substance that exists. And uh, it has effects on virtually every type of infection. It's bactericidal, viricidal, fungicidal, and parasiticidal. It also resets mitochondrial energy systems. If you go back to your biochemistry and you look at the mitochondria, what has to happen through the combination of glucose oxidation and, uh, and oxygen is that the electrons that come off get captured onto ATP. And the midway step is, has to go through NADH. 
and the ratio of NADH to NAD. NADH is the reduced form, and NAD is the oxidized form. The ratio has to be about 600. And in most people who are in pain or who don't feel well, they have a ratio where there's just no NAD to accept the hydrogen molecule that's coming off. And ozone resets that ratio. So it's a very, it's a very powerful treatment and it makes people better. Uh, it also helps with, with degenerative disease of joints and cartilage and ligaments because you can actually inject it uh, into tendon, tendon ligament insertion points and into joints and it helps to regenerate cartilage. So we, we have a very good success in people with chronic arthritic conditions with getting them out of pain um, because it, um, it, uh, it, it rejuvenates their joints. So that's kind of the, the sort of overview of, of this thing. And uh, it's very exciting medicine. So if, if, you know, I used to have some residents that came through and I contaminated them sufficiently, they got interested in it. Uh, but I think what you'll find on this is what's so interesting about it is that it's very, uh, we, you know, I've had to relearn a lot of my endocrinology and my biochemistry because that's really what we're using. You know, the active hormone, the active thyroid hormone is what? What's the active thyroid hormone? T3. T3. What's Synthroid? T4. How many patients have you had? We have a huge number of patients that come in and say, I'm taking Synthroid and I don't feel any better. Now their TSH is fine. Their T4 level is fine. They don't feel better. Well, it requires selenium and magnesium and vitamin C and a couple of other things to convert T4 to T3. If they don't convert, their cells need T3 to plug that receptor. They don't feel any better. Why would anyone give T4? I have no idea. Naturally, our own thyroids produce T1, T2, T3, T4. Most of it is T3, T4 in a ratio of about four or five to one. You can grind up a pig or a cow's thyroid and get that ratio, it's called armor thyroid. It's been around for, I don't know, probably 100 years, but it's not patentable. It's over the counter. It's not over the counter, but it's not patentable. It's very inexpensive. Um, it's very safe. Why wouldn't anyone use that? Because you actually do get a better response. And if you measure free T3, free T4, don't ever measure a TSH and think that you're screening somebody's thyroid. What if they have a mild pituitary insufficiency? Are you going to pick up their hypothyroid? Not at all. So we never do thyroid panels without free T3, free T4, reverse T3, and TSH. Because then you actually see what's happening. And we, also, we always get the, the autoantibody level. You know, antithyroglobulin uh, antibodies because they, they, they have inflammatory disease and you can handle their inflammatory disease if you know it's there and you know that that thyroid is being attacked by antibodies because something else is wrong. It's usually bad teeth and or what we call a leaky gut because all autoimmune disease virtually is is, is proteins leaking into the body that are foreign, that the body then makes a reaction to, that then those proteins that are leaking across look like our proteins, and so those antibodies, by mistake, cross-react and attack us. So, um, so I think that the, the level of medicine that can be practiced, if you, if you if you start to look at people in this way of how can we actually get them better, use pharmaceuticals for emergencies. If I have someone come in the office and they're 180 over 130 in a, with a headache, I will put them on antihypertensives. But it will hopefully be temporary while I try to find out what is it. And then they can gradually come off because their physiology is normalizing. You know, if our target is normalizing physiology, we can actually help people to get well. And if we don't, then we run into all the problems of the abnormal physiology that continues, but our numbers look a little bit better. And uh, 
and uh, but the patient actually isn't isn't really any better. Calcium channel blockers blockers cause brain shrinkage. It's known. It's just known. There's tons of papers on it. In an emergency, would I use one? Yes. But for long-term use, no. How many of your patients are on long-term medications to block stomach acid? Because they've got GERD. Tons of them. I think there's 24 million scripts a month written for H2 blockers. If you read the PDR and H2 blockers, they're for temporary relief, one to two weeks. Almost everybody I see has been on them for years and years and years and years. You know what you do when you block stomach acid? You know, the stomach acid has a couple of purposes. One of the purposes is that you don't digest proteins or absorb minerals if you don't have acid in your stomach. In your stomach, pepsinogen, which is a precursor to pepsin, which is the first step in protein digestion, requires acid. If the stomach pH is 7, Pepsinogen doesn't convert to pepsin, and you don't get protein digestion. And I've measured hundreds of patients who have been on long-term drugs like this, and you measure their serum amino acid levels, and you'll find that they're low. And they get degenerative disease because their amino acids are low, and they can't rebuild their bone, rebuild their immune system, rebuild their organ tissue, or, or their immune system. The other thing that's important about stomach acid is the food that we eat is not sterile. You know, the lettuce isn't sterile, the meat's not sterile, it's all got bacteria on it and maybe other things. And what's supposed to happen is when you eat that food, it gets in a bath with pH of 1 to 2 and it gets killed off. And what we see in people who, who are on blockers long term is when we do detailed stool analysis, we find that they're full of pathogenic bacteria, Klebsiella's, Citrobacter's, uh, uh, Campylobacters, H. pylori's, they're um, parasites. And, they, and you know, once the thing gets through, the environment in their intestines is very beneficial. It's warm, it's moist, there's lots of food there, and they, can, they, they have a happy time. But they, they produce waste products that affect us. It could be lack of sleep, it could be depression, it could be cloudy thinking, it could be IBS. And so if you actually find out, okay, let's get you off the blocker, let's get your protein levels up. I did a series of patients which were very interesting. They had three things in common. They couldn't sleep, they were depressed, and they were tired. And they were all on psychiatric medication for those symptoms. They were on a sleep pill, they were on an antidepressant, and then they were on, and, and for tiredness, they were, they were, I don't know, they weren't taking anything, <laughs> okay? They were drinking coffee, okay? And they were all on H2 blockers, long-term H2 blockers. And I did, I, did, I did amino acid serum levels on them. And I found they were all very deficient in tryptophan. Now, tryptophan is an amino acid. It's a precursor to melatonin, which has to do with sleep regulation. It's a precursor to NAD, which has to do with energy generation. And it's a precursor to serotonin, which has to do with mood. And when we replenished their tryptophan levels, gave them therapeutic doses of tryptophan, their fatigue went away, and their sleep got better, and their depression went away. Now that is, in my opinion, that is, that is good medicine. Because now we have a patient that's actually been rehabilitated to what they should be, and they're feeling well. And so that's that's what we're, that's 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 a, that's our passion. And there are a lot of technologies now that support that. And we've got I've collected so many different kinds of things, you know, pulsed magnetic field generators, ozone baths, things like this, which in people, depending on what they have, can be that sort of extra thing. That, that makes the difference and helps them to actually recover and, and get well, where they're not just sort of, you know, pharmaceutically regulated. And I'm not anti-pharmaceutical only when it's given for the wrong thing at the wrong time for too long a period. And so, uh, 
you know, this old, this old Hippocratic thing of, uh, first of all, do no harm. You know, there's about a, at least 100,000 people a year that are killed from medical therapies. They're killed in hospitals by doctors, by the treatments. I saw a very interesting thing the other day. It was comparing what's more dangerous to you. Is it, your, is it the guys in your neighborhood that own guns? Or is it the doctors that you go see? And they did this statistical analysis of how many guns are there per population versus how many doctors are there per population. And the doctors have a million times more chance of killing you than the gun owner that's on your block or in your neighborhood. You know? So, uh, you know hospitals are dangerous places. There's bad bugs here, there's mistakes that are made. So, doesn't mean that they shouldn't be here or that they aren't needed sometimes. Doesn't mean that at all. They are. Uh, and great pains are taken. I was an infectious disease control officer in a hospital for years. And, you know, the, the, the extremes that we went to to try to get people to wash their hands and, you know, verify and all this stuff. And, I'm, you know, I'm, I know it's done probably now even better now. Even with all that, there's problems. But if we can keep people out of hospitals, if our family practices can be havens where people get well. I have a, a very good friend in South Carolina who was a, he was chief of staff at a hospital there. He was, he was in family practice. And he, w he was chief of staff at the hospital, but he also would have 40 or 50 people in the hospital at any given time. Because um, uh, he had a very busy practice of sick people. And uh, he went to a seminar and learned how to do chelation, and then he started going around and learning all these other things. And he gradually, over several years, had no patients in the hospital. And the CEO of the hospital called him up, and he said, don't you love us anymore? What's wrong? Are you going to the competing hospital? What's wrong with us? He said, no, I love you guys. You get all my acute appendixes, and you get my pulmonary failures, and you get my, you know, my acute MIs, but I just don't have any. Or I have very few, because my people don't go in the hospital anymore. I actually, with what I'm doing, keep them out of the hospital so that they actually stay well. So, um, so that's the goal, and that's the um, that's what we that's what we do every day, and uh, it's extremely interesting because the stories are just extremely interesting to see, you know, people come back in four to six weeks and they say, I'm feeling better. I'm actually getting better. This is working on me. I had a recent lady, twelve pharmaceutical medications in two months. With a change of diet, supplementation, some IV, Myers cocktails, some ozone, off all 12 medications. You know, a couple for blood pressure, something for cholesterol, a couple for diabetes, something for pain. You know how it goes, something for sleep. But she actually just didn't need them anymore. And she had this very, this list of the 12 medicines, and every time she took it and she checked it, and then I saw her in a month, and then half of them were gone, and then I saw her at the end of two months, she says, you know, I'm not on any of this stuff anymore. And I look at her vital signs, and her blood pressure is good, and her pulse is good, and she's feeling good, and I think, whoa, that's a success. Saved her $1,000 a month in medication, and she's, she's well. So, um, anyway, I'm just, um, my wife actually opened my eyes to it, because the rule of doctors is if they don't know about it, they don't like it. Okay? And I was as bad as anybody. Uh, but she was persistent. She dragged me to meetings. I saw that the people who were talking about this stuff actually knew what they were talking about and it made sense. And, I went, you know, and then when we started to look at it for ourselves and see, boy, this really works. And I think right now, between 80 and 85% of the people that we see, we can actually help. They actually get better. And some of those 15 per 10 or 15 percent that we don't help, they just don't do it. You know, they just won't do it. And uh, we have some that, that we just haven't figured it out. And you know, we're on a quest. We go to meetings all the time uh, to find out, you know, who knows this, who's having success with this, what are they doing, can we do it here, uh, to try to improve, to try to improve our outcomes, so that we get, you know, so that we get better results. 
One of the things, I had a guy uh, two days ago come in. He's 68 years old. He came in because he wanted chelation therapy. His son is a cardiovascular surgeon in um, Phoenix. And his son was very, very adamant that he not go in, that what we were doing was all quackery. And that, um, that uh, there was no double blind studies on chelation that show that they do anything. And so I said we should call him back and show me all the double blind studies that have been done on stents and cabbages. There are none. It's never been studied. Never. We know that unless you have a high grade LAD lesion, the cabbage isn't going to prolong your life at all. It might give you some symptomatic relief, but medical therapy is better. Harvard, medical therapy is better. Does that stop uh, uh, hundreds, I don't know how many, I think it's close to, to 300,000 cabbages done every year? No. Do stints work? Not very often. 25-30%, they reblock. The chemo agents in them cause problems. Are there better therapies? Way better therapies. If you put together ozone and chelation and EECP, you can get asymptomatic every person I've treated who's got, who's got angina. You know, an acute angina, threatening angina, they're going to the hospital, they're getting whatever they get. But the chronic anginas or the chronic claudications, we haven't had one that didn't get symptomatically completely better. You know that there's probably 50 ECP machines in the county and practically none of them are being used by cardiologists. It just doesn't make any money. What's that stand for? I'm sorry. EECP, are you guys familiar with it? It's enhanced external counter pulsation. Now this is even a Medicare approved treatment if a cardiology writes that it's required because the person is too high risk for a stent or a cabbage. This therapy is very interesting. It's a, it's, a, it's a table where there's blood pressure cuffs put on the lower legs and lower abdomen. The person is hooked up to an EKG monitor so that these blood pressure cuffs blow up all at once during diastole. So when the heart relaxes, these things all blow up. It forces blood up into the internal organs, into the coronary arteries, into the brain. It increases the circulation through those conduits by about 25%. It turns on endothelial growth factor, which prompts the body to, new, to grow new collateral blood vessels. The average treatment is about 35 hours, so we do an hour a day, five days a week for about seven weeks. Every person that we've treated on it, we've been doing this for almost two years, uh, by 17 or 18 treatments, their cardiac symptoms are gone, their engine is gone. They don't take nitro anymore, they're feeling better. And by 35 treatments, they're, they're, you know, guys that could walk 50 feet with chronic claudication are now walking two miles asymptomatically. It's a great treatment. And it's, it's very underutilized because it's just, you know, the monetariness of it isn't that great. Uh, there's no deaths from it. Uh, the Los Angeles Lakers, after every game, get on it because it's a very good rehab therapy. It flushes out lactic acid. It hyperperfuses everything. I've used it for people too. You know, you get these people that are they're borderline Alzheimer's and they're or they're or they're mental cloudiness, and you do an MRI on their brain, and they've got these little white matter spots, and they say compatible with chronic cerebrovascular uh, problems. Do it on them because it kicks up the brain circulation by 25 percent. I had a 92-year-old lady who was brought in by her husband, uh, also 92 years old. Uh, he was a decorated four-star general, um, uh, was head of the Western Command, flew 172 combat missions in World War II. You know, like a six foot three, just he, at 92 he was still a general. And he brought his wife in because he said, whilst your health appears to be good, she can't remember anything and now she won't let me in the marital bed because she doesn't recognize me. And we've been married for 72 years. We got married when we were 20. Can you do anything for her? We've seen a bunch of neurologists. We, we really haven't got, we tried the various drugs. And it just doesn't, really hasn't done anything for her. So I said, I don't know, but I can look for things that we look for and we can try some treatments for a few months and see if we can make a difference. And so we did this extensive metabolic profile, and we found that she was severely protein malnourished.
her amino, her serum amino acid levels were very extremely low. She wasn't getting enough protein, and what she was getting, she wasn't digesting. So we were able to supplement her amino acids, both IV and orally. Uh, she was very magnesium deficient and selenium and zinc deficient. She had very high levels of lead in her blood. Um, and uh, she had a lot of stuff going on in her gut was the reason why she wasn't absorbing food. She had what we call dysbiosis. She had you know, bad bacteria and, and parasites. We treated that. And we gave her the IV vitamins and minerals, IV ozone, and we put her on this EECP machine for 35 treatments. And at the end of two months, she could count to 100. She went back to her scrapbook from, from, her, from her childhood, and she remembered you know, her childhood house and her mother. She could hold a conversation. She recognized her husband. She learned most of the names of the people in our clinic. She was able to do normal household chores. She could make the beds. She could do the dishes. And she was functional. She wasn't perfect, but the disease that she carried of Alzheimer's wasn't really Alzheimer's. It was severe malnutrition with systemic toxicity. And then when we were able to do those things, she was very, very much better, and they were so pleased about what happened. In fact, they were so pleased that her husband, who loved to play golf, but because of his chronic macular degeneration, had been uh, said to be legally blind. He'd also had a femoral bypass, but the bypass had clotted up and he was getting claudication. And this is the guy who could only walk 50 feet. So he said, what about me? So I said, well, we'll do the same thing with you. <laughs> we'll do the same thing on everybody, you know? What do you got that you shouldn't? What are you missing? Here's the, here's the supportive therapies. We try to normalize everything. We'll give it back. So we did him. By the time he finished the treatment, he'd gotten a two-line change in his visual and a 30% improvement in his, uh, in his retinal patterning, documented by his ophthalmologist. And he could now play golf, and he could beat his 70-year-old son in golf because he could now see the ball. <coughs> and he could walk two miles without his leg hurting. So these, are, these aren't extraordinary cases. They're the kind of things that we see a lot because what's wrong with people isn't the numbers that are normally looked at and that you can't really help these people. If you really like, see, the, the medical school and residency process is a very strict training program to give you regular medical know-how. And it's very good. And I'm really glad that I could probably step in, you know, when I see an acutely ill patient now, I, I feel comfortable because I have those medical skills. I, un, I know most of the pharmacology. I still understand that stuff. I worked with it for a long time. And so that the education that you're getting is very good, it's very important, it's very helpful. But what you have to realize is that it's a very narrow vision of what human physiology and health is all about. And then if you just start to go like this and test everything that everybody tells you about this is right or this is the cure or this is good against this sort of standard of, is the patient really better? Are they healthier? Are they going to live longer? Do they have more energy? Then a lot of times that isn't going to be, you know, that, that what is being done doesn't fit that criteria. I always take people off statins. Always. I don't even think about it. They've had everybody so brainwashed on this, it's ridiculous. There's more and more literature coming out now. More liver cancer, more diabetes, more Alzheimer's. I had somebody yesterday. His base cholesterol was 160 and his doctor put him on a cholesterol drug. It's better to have it lower. Now, all the steroid hormones are based on cholesterol. You've got a cholesterol of 120, you're not going to make you know, cortisol and, and aldosterone and, and estrogen and testosterone. So what are we doing? We know cholesterol is a protective molecule. It's protective. There's vascular, there's, there's endothelial inflammation. That is why cholesterol is being made. And when you calm somebody's CRP, high sensitivity CRP, I have one today. They came in with a high sensitivity CRP of 16 and a high cholesterol. And she said, what about my cholesterol? I said, don't worry about your cholesterol. It doesn't matter. 
Once we get the inflammation down, and she had a gut full of bad bugs, which was the primary source, and she had a lot of dental stuff that needed to be corrected. You know, pockets and root canal teeth and things like this. They had to get figured out. So it was chronic, low-grade infection. And once that got figured out, her repeat CRP today was one. I like it under one, but in, from June to now, it's extraordinary. Not a drug good. Okay? So these are physiologic, you know hypertension is a physiologic response. Why? Here's just one reason. A capillary is about a, has a, a size of about four or five microns. How big is a red blood cell? Six or seven. It's bigger. For the red blood cell to go through the capillary, it's got to go flat. Why do sicklers have trouble? Their, their cell membrane's messed up. Their hemoglobin's messed up. It's not, it doesn't conform right. Well, there's a lot of things that have to do with red cell membrane flexibility. Most of which is what kind of fats are they eating? Because the red cell membrane is a mixture of omega-3 and omega-6 fats. And if the person's getting no omega-3 fats and they're, yet, they're eating a lot of trans fats, you know, a lot of fried food and donuts and pastries and that sort of stuff, and they're not eating any, enough omega-3 fats, they have a stiff red cell membrane. And that membrane just doesn't go through very easy. And what would you do if you were a kidney cell out here or a muscle cell out here and you needed red blood cells so that you could get oxygen and relieve yourself of carbon dioxide and that red cell is stiff and it won't go through that capillary, what would you do as a physiologic uh, uh, change to make that go? What would you do? You'd raise the blood pressure, right? <laughs> You gotta pump it harder, you gotta push it through. So that poor person goes to the doctor and their blood pressure is 160 over 110. And the doctor says, well, you got essential hypertension and I'm gonna give you a medicine. And what happens then? Well, the blood pressure may or may not go down because half the time the blood pressure medicines don't even work. But when they do, have you improved that person's physiology? Not at all. You got a hypoxic cell out here. What do we know, the etiology, what is the, as far as what's known right now, what is the trigger for a cell to turn cancerous? It's hypoxia. Cancer cells don't use oxygen. And when they're oxygen deprived, they change their metabolism. They stop using the Krebs cycle and they go to glycolysis. Because they can't get oxygen, they have to make ATP somehow. So when we do these things, it's like, what are you doing? It's not the right thing. How about let's look at their fatty acid ratios. Let's get them off trans fats. Let's get them on the right stuff. You know, a, a diabetic with a blood sugar of 200 has a, 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 the blood rheology, the, the thickness of the blood is like maple syrup versus Gatorade. It's supposed to be pumping Gatorade. If you're trying to pump maple syrup through, it's dense, it's thicker. So now you've got a non-compliant red blood cell and you've got thick fluid. If you want to improve the physiology, you've got to get their sugars down and you've got to get their red blood cells more compliant. And that capillary is going to be in spasm if the magnesium and potassium levels are low. So you've got to correct those things. And when you do, you see the physiologic change. So all I'm saying is just like, like keep your ears and eyes open. And I wouldn't believe, you know, when I started medical school, my uncle was a, was a professor of medicine. And he said, and he was one of the first lecturers when we went into the class. And he said, I have something very exciting to tell you, which is also very depressing at the same time. And he said, the thing is that the, the improvements in medical knowledge now are extraordinary, and it's doubling every month or two. But the problem is, 50% of what you, we are going to teach you today is false. And the tragedy of it is, we don't know which half is which. I, when I, in my first year of medical school, my dad had an MI and he was in the hospital. And he was told by his cardiologist to go home and never eat anything but oleomargarine again. Because that was the safest fat for him to eat. 
and we know oleum margins are very damaging fat now, 40 years later. But medical knowledge is suspect. It's suspect. When you see with your own eyes that these things are really improving things, I, wouldn't, I don't believe anything. Even the stuff I do. If I don't see it work 25 times in a row, I don't believe it. Because if you're doing the right thing, it'll work, you'll see it, and you'll see it in the patients. And it's less medication, more vigor, more health, um, and, uh, and, uh, and not in the hospital. Okay? Any questions? <laughs> Have I scared you off? <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, again, thank you very much for coming and, and for the lecture. Um, I've been a family physician for 20 years, so as I sit and listen, some of the things you say makes me uncomfortable. Um, and and I, I think you're right. A lot of what we learn today uh, is not going to be accurate in the future. And you bring up the personal pump inhibitors and the two blockers. And I think some of that was probably some brainwashing on the part of the pharmaceutical companies. Um, you know, I always try to say what's what's evidence based. We say what's evidence based, and, and look and try to look at evidence. And so, for complementary alternative medicine, a lot of times I'll go to the uh, NIH website, the NCCAM, which I think is a good, at least in my opinion, non-biased presentation. So, chelation it came out in JAMA and showed a 18% decrease in cardiovascular event compared to standard therapy. That was interesting, and that something probably you made that statement 10 years ago you were probably looked at as if you were an alien, I would imagine. Even now, it's being, it's, it's, it's being, it's being panned by medical authorities. Um, but you're, at, you're absolutely right. Part of the problem with this, see, everybody who, who's, who's doing chelation knows that chelation works. Patients know it works. Uh, the, 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 the evidence base is there. The problem is that the, the, the resources to really do it well, uh, there's, you know, there's no one's, no one's going to fund this stuff. I think you hit, you hit the nail on the head is that not everyone has those resources. So if you took a patient who's had a previous MI and is motivated, wants to make lifestyle changes, has the financial resources to do so, there's probably lots of different ways you could treat that individual to prevent a secondary outcome. Unfortunately, most of the United States is not that way. So you go back to, well, what's standard? We can't do nothing. So, you know, like, I'm not going to take my patients off of statins who've had a MI before because most of them are not going to make the lifestyle changes. So, to me, that is a much better alternative and based on the evidence I've seen than to do nothing. So I think some of it is you have to have the right patient population to be able to do the, the things that, that you suggest. Uh, and, and, yeah, and I mean, I think what happens to change, right. too. I, I think what happens is doctors get beaten down by patients. They try to beat me down. And, and I try to, you know, when I look at the cholesterol evidence, you've got to treat 100 people to help one. That's not very good. And, and they, they, the way they play with the numbers is it's, it's, it's you know, it's, it isn't good science either. So, and as a family practitioner, I think that, that if, if, you know, you sort of attract to you, you the, the problem with the medicine we do is that, or the good thing about it is that nobody can tell me what to do. You know, I, a lot of times I'll see Medicare patients and we don't take Medicare, but I will write a script for them to go to a regular laboratory and do the, the, the sort of panels that I want, which are regular laboratory tests, some of them. Uh, but most doctors aren't doing, uh, they're not doing homocysteines or, or, or fasting insulins or, you know, some of these extra things that I'm looking for to, to like, try to collect the risk factors. Uh, but to get somebody else to pay for this is the big hurdle. Uh, and it's true, a person's paying for this out of their own pocket. Now, I can just tell you that, that in terms of the cost to the medical system, this kind of medicine is very inexpensive compared to the, you see that this current medical system is not sustainable. It's just not sustainable. It's going bankrupt. It's going to bankrupt the whole country. Because I know as a doctor, you have to practice, when, as an emergency room doctor, I had to practice defensive medicine. You know, I've got a 35 year old that comes in with chest pain. He's getting everything. You know, he might be having an anxiety attack. Or he's got a little costochondritis. He's getting everything. Because if I miss an MI, I'm getting hung. And so people get a lot of stuff that they maybe don't need 
and it drives up the cost. And drugs are expensive, so it drives up the cost. Uh, but uh, this, if you look at patients handled with the way we're doing it versus the traditional system, the expenses are enormously reduced uh, because um, they stay out of the, they stay out of more often the big expensive stuff. You know, what I've sort of begun to learn as I get involved in this is whenever a patient comes into your office, before you look at what predominates in terms of their symptoms, you have to look at balance. You know, I think like you're saying, you know, what are they lacking? What do they have too much of? Because what is too much is producing a problem. What they don't have enough of is producing a problem. And however you manage to do that through your testing, your abilities to do that, is a, a lot of like this oriental yin and yang and the balance of a body. I mean, I, I think, it's, it's been really impressed upon me that people come to your office out of bounds. And how do you do it holistically? And, and not just to manage it with a pill, but to, to look at their, their, their psychosocial components, all these other dynamics, and try to facilitate that balance. You know, I'm not aware of all these other dynamics that you're using with these patients, some of these technologies, but ultimately your goal as a family physician is to restore the balance. And how you do that, and there is no doubt that pharmaceutically, in terms of how we're trained, it can be sort of misleading because you can prove it through evidence that those medications bring something. But it doesn't always restore the ultimate pathology that is, is going on. I mean, as that is integrated content, Dr. Permuter, who mm -hmm. recently wrote this mm -hmm. book, yeah. meaning, and, and, and his lecture was, was absolutely fascinating in the sense that by the time pharmaceuticals look to something, it is at a spectrum that's really at the end of the disease process. It does not take you to the front. And this inflammatory component, is, is, it's in the medicine forefront for us. Meaning, you know, life is inflammation. Cardiac disease is inflammation. So many of these things are inflammation. And how do you shut off this inflammatory cascade? And yeah, yeah, and, 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 yeah, and really, how do you look for it? Yeah. See, I think when you give somebody Embryl, you're writing them a note, you know, you're, 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 that's a dangerous treatment. Because their, their, their cytokines are raging because they have an underlying toxicity infection that is causing their disease. And I've got lots of really severe rheumatoid arthritis patients that come in and they can't even walk and they can't even sit down. And after three or four months, they're riding, motor, they're riding their motorcycle and they're, I got one now, it's working for me. He's a nuclear engineer, he's a very educated guy. He's had rheumatoid arthritis, really severe rheumatoid arthritis with major deformities. Couldn't sit down to go to the bathroom. And in three months, he's riding a motor scooter and I, he's working for me now. And his joints are reduced, his pain is gone. He feels great. And we didn't give him Emeril. We found out that he had a, you know, he had Lyme and mycoplasma in his joints and he had a dysbiotic gut and he had a lot of low hormones and and through just physiologic rehabilitation he's doing really good so it's it's um, here's the other barrier that that, 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 or, that or, or you know these things are sort of two two-faced things I can't see a patient in 10 minutes you know I spend an hour an hour and a half with every new patient 30 to 45 minutes on every recheck. Now, it's me and them. There's no insurance company in the middle. There's nobody else paying me. It's their paying me. So I'm, they, when they come into my practice, they are part of my family. They all know it. They feel it. The whole staff, that's how it operates. So the atmosphere is very different than an assembly line or so many. When I was a pediatrician, I was seeing 40 to 50 kids a day. You know, every 10, 15 minutes, oh, ear infection, amoxicillin. Oh, you're in fact croup. Okay, here, here's some Decatron. Da, 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 just like, uh, run the hospital. Okay, I did it for years and years and years. I know what that's like. But when you t when you deal with people with these with these sorts of things that have chronic conditions, uh, they they take time. They got to talk to you. You got to figure out what is you know what is happening with them. And some of that some of that therapy is just they got somebody that they can talk to that's not rushed, that will listen to them and that will help them find out, and then they get more compliant, and then they're willing to spend their hard-earned money 
to, to pay you directly because the exchange is really there. And somebody else isn't telling you what you can order, what you can't order, is this okay, da 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 da. I just say to them, look, this is, you know, this is, you just budget some money every year for your, you know, I, I, we budget the same money. I have, well, we're on Medicare now, but, <laughs> but I, I'm not going to use Medicare, you know. So it's just, it's, it's getting people, we just have to get people like, like changed because they're in this rut and as a physician it gives you freedom because they're not telling you what to do. When, when I worked in the emergency room, they would audit every chart. If we ordered, if we ordered stuff on people who were no pays, we got dinged. If we ordered lots of stuff from people who were paid, we got, we got rewarded. I don't have anybody looking over my shoulder. I am doing what I really think is best for that patient. And I know I'm spending his money. But I know I'm doing it in a, in a, in a, in a very uh, careful way uh, because he's got to trust me and uh, that I can really help him. So, um, so as a as a as a physician, just uh, two more just two more things. There are great you know when we started, we looked all over the place and we went here and there. Now there's there's two or three national organizations which train physicians and certify tradition uh, physicians. The American Academy of Anti Aging Medicine has phenomenal training programs for doctors and and PAs and nurses. You know they're done on weekends. You know like every quarter it would be like a Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday. There's certification exams. The best people in the country are there teaching. They're really good. And they will teach you complementary medicine. Um, the Institute of Functional Medicine is another one. That's where we learn most of our stuff. Fantastic training programs where you'll take your base of uh, anatomy and physiology and they'll have you like look at it this way. You know, here's, how, here's what you test. Here's how you test. Here's what you do when you get this test back. And now these laboratories, these laboratories, you know, where I get this big panel, it's got 184 different vitamins and minerals and amino acids and essential fats. When I get that test back, the first probably 25 or 30 of them, I call the laboratory. They have a physician on staff who will talk me through the thing. And teach me. So that I, so, you know, so that I can do it. I don't call them much anymore because I mostly know it. But these education, you know, once you're done with this, you're up to here right now, and you have to, you have to just do this stuff. But once you're done with this, um, there are facilities where you can learn this and expand at your own rate, but where you can keep your eyes open and uh, and and learn uh, what might be better, um, and then you can decide you know, so that you can actually look and see. You want to give those websites, A4M and ACAM and IFM? The, the A4M is just A4M.com, and uh, it, the other one is IFM. It's Institutional it, Institute for Functional Medicine. It's it's AFM, IFM.com. Uh, and there, um, ACAM.com. Uh, another one is ACAM. It's American Academy, uh, American College for Advancement in Medicine, ACAM.org. And they sort of, that's where we learned chelation, so they certify doctors in chelation. There's meetings twice a year. They get great people. Um, and uh, so you can sort of educate yourself. You can just open your horizons. And it's, um, it's very fulfilling. So I, I've never been more excited about being in practice in my life. You know, most of the guys my age are retiring or trying to. And uh, my office manager is 43, and she said, you know, I'm going to work until I'm at least 65. So you got 22 more years, you're not going anywhere. And I said, you're right, I'm not. It's, we're just having fun. Uh, because, uh, you know, the rewards when you see these changes in people are very, they're, they're very fulfilling. Okay? Good. Thank you Thank so you. much. Thank you.